What has to happen in this process, God is wanting desperately to mature us, the undergirding of this as we go through the process over and over and over and over and over again, as he's bringing us from faith to faith, from glory to glory, is that in the, in the underlying part of it, we are accelerating upwards simply because we are maturing in our intellectual ability to lay down the thing that I thought was right and accept what God says is right, to lay down what I feel is right and accept what God is, what God's feelings are towards this reality, whatever it would be that you are facing. me to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30, and I want <clears throat> to, I'm going to finish off finally, I'm believing to be able to do that tonight anyways, uh, I want to finish off the teaching that I was doing before, if you remember the chart, remember the thing, <laughs> right, you all know where we are on that chart, but I want to finish off tonight so that, because I, I really have got it on my heart to start something, once we get to Sunday, God wants to uh, really begin to change some things and go on to a different subject. Uh, but what I want to talk about tonight is emotional humility. Uh, I kind of woke up with it about two or three weeks ago. I never really said those words together in a sentence before. And God began to speak to me about uh, understanding how we all recognize that humility is an essential piece of the journey. If you remember when we were talking here, uh, when the seed comes, the word of the Lord comes, we're kind of down here in this misery zone. What needs to happen as we are going along here is we need to exercise humility in order to recognize that maybe what we believe is wrong and that what God believes is right, and we got to submit that belief system to the Lord in order to begin the transformation process. We can, all, we can stay all of our lives stubbornly in God's face or whatever in the Word's face and say, no, 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 that's not right, that's not right, that's not right. So humility is the beginning of the process. Uh, but there's a certain kind of humility. It's almost like, if I could say it like this, an intellectual humility that is in play here, where we already think we understand that the, what God is trying to show us isn't actually the case. It's, we're actually right. But what, I've, what I noticed doing it, sort of going through this curve oftentimes in my life, that there is a second level of humility that is required, but we learn a lot from the first level of humility that empowers us to survive the second half of the humility. Now, the second part of the humility is really what goes on over here, and that's really dealing more with emotional humility. That the, that the, 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 the difficult work in the first season is understanding that what God is saying is right. The difficult work in the second season is the dealing with the negative emotions that we are, that are constantly flooding us as we are beginning the process of the transformation that is going on in our heart. So it requires us to understand, first of all, how to deal with the intellectual issues and how to get your brain to accept what God is saying is true. But then the second level would be to understand how to process the negative emotions quickly when we're really feeling like things are coming apart like a $3 watch. And so what I'd like to finish off this, this, this teaching with is an understanding of how to, uh, how to get a hold of those emotional difficulties that are really slowing down our process through the belly of this transformational process. But before I do that, what I want to do is I want to also alert you to uh, the cycle of, what's the right way to say it, a historical cycle that we are in right now that has the tendency to produce a people group, a society, a culture of people who are not really well disposed to handle negative things emotionally. And this is, how, this is the way cycles go. If there's any history teachers in the room, you'll know that the, the, the cycles of society have gone through processes that go from, one, it being a world filled with chaos, and then out of that chaos, what is uh, what's required in order to try to harness all the chaos 
is that we go into a suppression season when the people who are strong start to exert that strength over people who are weak and try to organize these things in a, in a, in a somewhat of a productive cycle. It doesn't tend to be really pr pr productive because it's very much a violent time, but nevertheless, this season of suppression tries to take on order inside of the chaos at a very small level. The end result of that suppression cycle is a time when there's a tyranny that, that finally arrives, which you know, tyranny would be bad. Let's say we would call it a monarchy, maybe if we want to look at that as being a good thing, when finally what happens is, is that all the tribal type of things that happen in this suppression season kind of organize themselves until there's one king of the hill kind of a guy, and now he is now dictating in a very dictatorial way how society and culture and all of those things are going to go. Then what happens is it starts to, once things start to move forward inside of this tyrannical, and tyranny is not necessarily bad, it has proven to be bad uh, in our history, but it's not really a bad thing, it's part of the cycle. It's almost like when, you, when there's chaos, you know, or let's say we go in the pink room right now and there's 35 little kids back there, somebody needs to come in and slap their hand on the table and get everybody in order and it's kind of like I need there to be a dictator in there or else you're never going to get this thing handled, yeah. right? That kind of a thing. Now it's proven to be bad, but then the good part of it is it start, this process starts to move things forward in an orderly way. And then what starts to rise up is something that I don't know exactly how to say it, but it's kind of like a republic starts to arise. This is when, the, this is when one person kind of has all the power and the wealth. And then the republic starts to come up now because the people are kind of getting organized. They're kind of getting things in a flow. They're really not worried anymore. They're kind of inside the economy, inside the safety, inside the zone that is being created by this tyrannical rulership. And they start to organize. And so then the power starts to move to the people. Then what happens after that is it if it can get this far, now understand sometimes it falls apart and goes back to chaos a thousand times in this process as we see in our world today. But if it keeps on going, then what happens is, is that we, we develop a democracy, which is really then the wealth to the people. And then once we get the wealth to the people, wonderfully, we start to go into a season of moral decline. Ending up back into chaos. Now, the important thing here would be to understand why do we go back out of this wonderful place here of republic and, and, and democracy, which is where we are at right now. We are right now somewhere in this cycle right here as we are moving from a republic, which is where the, the rule is based on law. Here, to here, the rule is based on the people or the will of the people. When the rule goes to the will of the people, which is kind of what we're seeing going on in our world right now, you tend to, because you're being, because you are being governed now by uh, the, the, the majority, you're being governed by the masses, now whatever the masses do becomes the majority. What tends to happen is that uh, ideological things, like we see in our world today, ideological things tend to be the things that drive things forward, which tends to be very liberal and not at all based on the principles that have been coming down through this process. What that does is it starts, because we've now got, if you can imagine what's happening here, and we see it in our world, the wealth that's being created through this process is increasing continually, particularly into the hands of the people. The problem with that is that then the people become, um, the average person now has the time to worry about how they feel. And there's really no pressure, there's no, 
there's no wolf at the door. There's no war going on. There's more, no negative that people really have to deal with, which is what's always happening in this process here. Chaos, oppression, tyranny. There's always terrible things going on that people have to really just live their lives in a very logical way. And really, the, the, the part of it here is you just don't even deal with your emotions, right? Even the way we, were be, we would be raised. We would be raised by people coming out of this process in a way to say, we need to, you know, boy named Sue kind of thing, or I need to make you a tough, tough person because there's no room for, for, for emotions here. The guy who's emotional gets killed in the ring and the fight's over for him. Then when we get into these lower areas where the, in the societal structure that we have, we raise people who are very attentive to how they feel, which isn't the way we would be raised in other times. Then what happens is that we tend to be people who are, uh, because of the process, we never really have issues in our life where we are forced to deal with our negative emotions. There isn't a time then when difficulty comes when we have a model by which we would say, this is how you need to process these emotions. Understanding then when we come into this cycle with the Lord to come into the, how do you deal with this level two difficult season, the hardship and the emotion, not really hardship, it's just an emotionally difficult time most people just get crashed and burned somewhere in here when it's really not necessary if we learn the skills of becoming emotionally humble. Now, what does emotionally humble mean? Emotionally humble, I got a definition for you here, is that if there is a negative emotion attached to your perception of what is going on, then your perception is somehow tainted with deception. It's just like when we talked a year, a couple, maybe a year ago now, we were talking about the issue of fear. That if there is ever any fear in your perception, the only way there can be fear in your perception is if something about your perception is based on a deception. It's not based on truth. So then what you're able to do is anytime you perceive an environment where I'm getting afraid right now, then I can automatically say whatever I'm perceiving right now is hogwash Come on. because I'm perceiving it wrong because right. there is actually nothing to be afraid of. <clears throat> it, it, it's exactly the same thing happens when we, can, uh, we perceive something and with that thing comes a negative emotion. When a negative emotion is there, I can automatically say something, at least I should automatically say, Something about what I am feeling right now is based on a lie. It's based on a deception. If I do that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if I do that and I short circuit the emotion just because it's got a negative component to it. So all, because what happens is when we grow up in a society, a culture like this that celebrates emotion, and really, you know, there's just uh, the, the emotional well-being of somebody is, a, is an important part of our culture. What we do then is we validate emotions, whether they're good or they're bad. Yeah. As we validate those emotions, we actually promote that they would be matured, which you'd think, well, every now and again, you get a good one and that's promoted, which is a good thing. Every now and again, you get a bad one, that's promoted, that's a bad thing. So kind of 50-50, we kind of balance out. No. Emotions, when they are built on deception, are always bad. And we know, right, coming up in a culture where not everything we were taught or learned is, a, is the truth. Right. We are, we, no matter what situation we're coming to, there may be positive emotions in that experience, but it's trumped by all the negative emotions. Right. And so what happens to us is we start feeding into the negative emotions, not really realizing that we're feeding into them. We're just trying to deal with the situation. What we're actually doing, if we don't do this very, very carefully, we are going to be accelerating the maturity process in emotions that we don't even want. When we do that, 
we're actually revalidating over and over and over in our heart. We keep revalidating by validating the emotion. We are validating the belief system underneath the emotion. And it gets harder and harder and harder and harder for us to be able to get rid of that emotion. Because it's been there for so long, it seems like it belongs there. But it doesn't. In order for us to get through the process, the important component would be, the, the, the important starting component would be, if to, I, to the humility part would say, if it's negative, there's something, in, there's a lie in it. What, I, what happens as soon as I do that is the same way as you would have a negative thought. When the negative thought produces, uh, when the thought produces a negative on the inside of you, if your automatic first base is going to say there's something wrong with that thought. Right. Now, all of a sudden, that thought doesn't have the ability in an intellectual person, that thought doesn't get the ability to spiral downwards right. uh, for two weeks yeah. into a state of overwhelming depression. Yeah. Because we nipped it at the bud right at the beginning. Yes. If this doesn't feel good, there's something wrong with the thought. What you have to do with emotional uh, qualities as well, because some people are more left brain, some more right brain, some more emotional, some more intellectual. We are all a mixture of those two things. What has to happen in this process, God is wanting desperately to mature us the undergirding of this as we go through the process over and over and over and over and over again as he's bringing us from faith to faith, from glory to glory, is that in the, in the underlying part of it, we are accelerating upwards simply because we are maturing in our intellectual ability to lay down the thing that I thought was right and accept what God says is right, to lay down what I feel is right and accept what, God is, what God's feelings are towards <clears throat> this yeah. reality, whatever it would be that you are facing. If we learn to do that, our journey through this difficult season right here, it kind of starts getting easier right there because we start getting a harvest. Things start to work. The difficult part is all the humility that is required to stay in the game and short circuit all the human things yeah that prevent us from getting through the journey quickly, particularly in a culture that is already predisposed because of sort of being in this section here to not mature well in our emotions because we really just have never had to do it. I mean, if you consider a world now in the last 10 or 15, 20 years, we're celebrating emotional realities in the most extraordinary of ways. What that's doing is it's promoting negative emotions. I mean, if you have them, you should have them because you have them. Obviously, they're right because you must be right. Therefore, the emotion must be right since you're actually right. And all we need to go is just keep on going down this emotional road and then everything will end up in nirvana somewhere down the... I mean, don't use nirvana. Let's say <laughs> something else is heaven down the end of the road there. But that's not going to be the case. What happens is, is that as you, as you sow into negative emotions, they grow. Yeah. Right. They increase and they start to become more and more valid as we get further and further and further down the road. Are you in 1 Samuel at all? Let's watch now as David goes through a situation that is very similar. I mean, it might not be exactly the same as what we go through, but... It, relatively speaking, what we go through here, which other cultures would consider super lightweight, having a bad hair day or something like that is an emotional catastrophe for us, is the same thing as what would have been an emotional catastrophe in David's day that would be much more significant. And so here we, we pick up with David here. He's now got his band of mighty men <clears throat> and they are you know, going around doing the things that they're doing. When they're out, uh, out of their home city of Ziklag, the, the enemy comes in the back door and burns down their city and steals all their wives and children and stuff. How many of you are saying David's having a bad hair day here? <laughs> this is a bad day. I mean, the emotions of how that feels are very significant. 
He's the chief cook and bottle washer here. He's the guy in charge. It's his fault that these human beings that he loves and cares about and the families and children of the people he loves and cares about in battle have now been stolen, taken away as slaves. You can only imagine some of the pictures that are going through David's head here. What David does now is he deals with the negative emotion so that he can be a leader and get the answers to what do I do now? And watch what he does. Listen, it's very, very important. Now David was greatly distressed, as we can all imagine, for the people spoke of stoning him. So that's like a lot of pressure. He's going, and he's taught these guys how to fight. He knows they know how to fight. He's no match for these other guys. Because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man, his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. Your Bible might say David encouraged himself in the Lord. Listen, what, has, what the reality of the negative emotions that we feel, the first thing we do is stop validating the emotion. The second thing we do is we go to the Lord and find out what the heck is going on here. When we can do that, simple, get your emotions. Everybody has lots of emotions, right? People who don't show emotions, it's not that they don't have them. They've just got them so that they're trained and they are orderly and they are useful and they are uh, governing or governed and all of those type of things. When it runs out of control, and you can be like, this is, this is me. I can be very controlled in one area and very out of control in another area. Right. Because the emotions are built, up, are, are just because you have trained and organized one emotion does not mean that you've trained and organized another one. And so what David is doing here is he's got all of them coming at him at once. And he's able to say, stop, don't fight. How many know that's, that's, if you were in that situation, the first thing I want to do is fight. I need somebody to blame, very first thing I need. I need to be able to deflect and defend. I need to be able to do all the D words as I get this. No, see, David didn't do that. He stopped the situation, backed up, and got himself orderly in his emotions. The Bible says it like encouraged himself, strengthened himself, uh, uh, became orderly. And then what did he do? He went before the Lord. Listen now. Um, Then David said to Abiathar the priest, uh, 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 Amalek's son, please bring the ephod here to me. He's ready to go into before the priest. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquiring of the Lord, saying, So David now takes the situation to the Lord and says, okay, Lord, what would you have me do? And the Lord's answer to him was, go after the people who got your your stuff, and we're going to get it back. And so David now, out of that peaceful moment when his emotions are all under control, he's able to go into the presence of the Lord and find out from the Lord what needs to be done. Then once he's heard... Now, remember, if you go into the Lord and you're all wired up in your emotion, right? If I'm angry at my neighbor and I say, Lord, should I kill him? The Lord's going to say, yep. (laughs) That's the problem. Lots of people go into the Lord and try to get an answer from him when their emotions are going to cloud over everything. If I don't first come in and say, okay, emotions, I recognize I don't need you. Even though David, you would say David's in a desperate situation here, he would say, no, I'm not in a desperate situation. There's nothing for my emotions to be concerned about right now. God is no less God today than he was two days ago. When I can do that now, now you can't necessarily do that right away. This is something that is a learned activity. I know when I was learning this, I would have told you that I was not an emotional person. Live long and prosper. I associated myself with Spock. Not Kirk. Until I started to open up the Pandora's box that was my emotions. And it kind of came loose like a $3 watch. I had, because I had 
This is what happened with my story. When I was a kid, I just didn't really know how to deal with my emotions, and there wasn't really a lot of understanding like you're all getting blessed with today. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. When I had all these negative emotions, I found no use for them. And so what I did was I buried them because they're, they're messing me up. I just need to be Spock, one plus one equals two, let's go get her done. But then when I decided that life was not good in black and white, and I start to then, the Lord wants me to begin to open up those emotions, I had no ability to control them once they came out. They were like pink room people <laughs> on the inside of me. And I had to learn in the midst of this, uh, I, should, I should not give credit to myself. I say I had to learn. I had to be taught yeah, right. how to handle all the negative emotions that are in this season. This season is ridiculously hard if you don't take on the project of disciplining your emotions and learning how to do it. But once you do do that, if you first couple of runs through the process, you're saying, okay, what I really want to do, Lord, is I want to learn how to discipline my emotions. I want to know how to ignore the bad ones in such a way that I get rid of the bad ones. Because yeah. then you go through it next time and it's like, shippity doo -dah, this is easy. Yeah because there is no real negative emotions that you're having to really learn how to battle because you've already learned that part. So when you're going through this process, understanding, first of all, that we are not a culture that is going to find this an easy thing to do. That's just got to be a Selah moment. If you go back, like imagine what it's like to have negative emotions in the middle of World War II, they slap it out of you before breakfast. Because nobody's got time, right? If you're in a stressful situation, like if you go to the nations, you'll find that they're very, very orderly in their emotions. Not because they're happy, but because nobody goes to somebody else and wrecks their day with, I don't go to Mike and say, here's all my bad emotions to add on to yours for the day. We do that in our culture because we're a wealthy, prosperous culture. And we got all kinds of time to do that. And it's fun. At least it appears to be fun. And so that's the process that we live through, not realizing that when we come to actually make transformational uh, advancements in our lives, that those same emotions are going to become our enemy. They're going to be so unruly and we will feel so confused in the process because we're trying to decide what's right and wrong <clears throat> by listening to feelings that we don't know whether they're right or wrong. Easy. Easy. If they're bad emotions, they're wrong. They're built on deception. Can I tell you something? The Lord said this to me. This is, I've, I've said this to you, I think, before. He showed me when Jesus was going to the cross. And he was pointing out to me in the New Testament, Jesus said, you know, if you look at a woman lustfully, then you've already committed adultery. How many of you know that scripture? Hate that one, of course. But the, the, that means that if there would have been any anger inside of Jesus, any unforgiveness, any jealousy, any covetousness, any regret, any of these type of emotions on the inside of him that are built upon uh, uh, deceptions, he would have sinned. And if he sinned, he don't get to do the go to the cross and save you from your sin. That means Jesus got all the way to the cross and died without expressing one single negative emotion. That's why when we understand the Lord showing it to me, when Jesus is up on the cross, he's thinking, the, the, you know, these people, these bullies who have unleashed hell in his life are about to have Heavenly Father unleash hell on them. Because whatsoever a man sows, you remember that, that scripture? That's in the Bible. And so... He, Jesus is all about understanding that, and he says what? Father, forgive, forgive them. them. Father, listen to me. Put your safety back on the gun here. So all the way even to that moment, Jesus is still concerned about the bullies who are bullying him, putting him to death. When Jesus went through his entire life, Jesus never experienced a negative emotion. Even in Gethsemane, when he was pressured in, we have this idea inside of our head that Jesus was, please God, if there's another way, 
Instead, what he was doing is the same thing that David was doing in, uh, as he returned to Ziklag. Jesus in the garden was strengthening himself, just like David. If you read all the Psalms, you know, the Psalms, Psalms start off with David whining. You know, I love the Psalms. It kind of matches my life a lot. Starts off by saying, oh, the bulls of Bashan are surrounding me. My bones are being dried up in my, all of these. But, and then he says, but Lord. He goes, nevertheless. And then he goes on to say, but Lord, you. You are great. Your power is awesome. You have made a way for me. There is an answer. There is a resolution. There is a victory. And he finishes off the psalm by saying what, what he knows. That's the encourage yourself in the Lord and become strengthened by this process, just you and God. Before you have anything, you don't have anything else to do. You've got to learn the ability of getting yourself out of the negative emotions. Now, I'm not saying there's not other people around, but let me give you my list of things you should not do at the moment when emotional things come up and overtake you. One, you can go here to James chapter 1, one of the most powerful scriptures, I think, in the Bible, where he says, count it all joy when you face diverse temptations, trials and temptations. Those are the things that normally have the power to ignite negative emotions in your life. That's count it all joy. That if you count it all joy, you will unleash the power of endurance. Then the power of endurance becoming complete and mature you'll be lacking in nothing. You see, this is this process right in here. If you will just count it all joy, you get to the, to the season of harvest when you'll have whatever it is that you need. You just have to have the ability yes. to count it all joy. You've got to have the ability to ignite the power of endurance in your life. There's certain things that if we do them, the very last thing that they're going to accomplish in us is the power of endurance. So let's take a look at some of those things. One, don't talk about it. Particularly, can I say this? Don't talk to yourself about it. How many of you have ever had one of those moments where you've had a negative emotion come up and you've said your piece and then you walk away thinking, oh, I should have said this, I should have said this. Oh, if I'd have said that, oh, I'd have had them. What you're doing is you're encouraging yourself in the negative emotion. You go home and you say, honey, I need to talk to you about this. And at you go at it, you go at it again. What are you doing? You're not encouraging yourself out of the negative emotion. You're encouraging yourself in the negative emotion. So don't do it. Stop. Learn to not talk about it. Why? When you talk about it, what happens with negative emotions is they create energy on the inside of you, like a hurricane. If you release that energy out of your mouth, the energy's gone. But then what'll happen is it's because you all feel better about it. Oh, I just feel so better now that I've talked to you about it. And then you walk away and it starts again. Boom, 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 as the volcano comes up again. Then you talk to somebody, and it's, okay, it's all good now. I've talked, I've released all the energy, but it's not dealt with. All we've done is encourage it. Instead, what we need to do is we need to use the negative energy to deal with the situation. Why do I believe up this thing? Why does this thing bother me? I got to get my butt into the presence of the Lord in a calm and neutral manner so that I can find out what does God have to say about this negative emotion? If I can just do that, letting that thing subside on the inside without coming onto the outside. The words are seeds. Your mate might not have agreed with you, but once he listens to you talk about it for six or seven days, he probably will believe you by then. And that's not a help to you because you've just revalidated it at another level. Don't do that. Let it stop. Now, I'm not telling you that I need you to bottle up negative emotions for the rest of your life. That too would be bad. That's like a zit. You don't want to bottle that baby up too long. You want to be able to deal with it. But deal with it by talking about it doesn't work. Unless, we'll talk about the do's in a minute, there is a way you can talk about it, 
that you can get it resolved, but it's not go and talk about it with people who are going to agree with you that your negative emotion is something you should have. Okay, here we go. Number two, don't build a posse. You know, I have this, this concept in my head right now that some of us learned strategies when we were in high school and on, the, on our street gangs, and we learned that there was power in a posse. And so every time we feel that there's a negative emotion going on, the very first thing we want to do is build a posse. No, posses are bad because they're not going to help you to deal with the problem. They're only your posse because they have the problem too. They agree with you that that's the proper response to that situation. And that's why they're coming up and encouraging you that you need to go and bite that person's head off. Don't do that. It's just going to slow down your process. You know, Pastor Ian says this and this and this and this and this, and now I'm feeling all these negative emotions, so I'm going to hunt around the church for somebody who's also having those negative emotions, and we're going to tell Pastor Ian that he's wrong. Now, tell me if I'm wrong if I want, but that didn't help you. It just empowered you actually to go in the opposite direction because now there's two of you that think the word of God isn't the truth. Do you see how that is? We do that exact same thing all the time when it comes to dealing with this really difficult misery that is going on on the inside of us. Number three, don't own the, min the misery. Don't become the negative emotion. You may have that negative emotion 72 times a day. It is still built on something inside of you that doesn't belong to you. You were not ever intended to be deceived. Your, your father in heaven never intended that your, that your whatever, slave master the devil was going to fill you with negative thoughts, and, uh, negative uh, or uh, deceptions. So you don't own that thing. Oh, this is, I guess, the rest of my life. I'm just going to be like this. I'm just a jealous person. No, no. The, 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 the root of that thing has nothing to do with you. It was implanted in you by the dark side. It's a deception. Paul talked about these things like they were light momentary afflictions. Momentary. If I can feel it, I can get rid of it. And so whatever you are at the root of this negative emotion, you got to go. I'm on your trail. I'm going to hunt you down. And you're soon needing a new home because you ain't living here anymore. Number four, don't bury the, the, the misery. Misery is a primary indicator to a potential growth area in your life. This is important because I had a significant problem with God for a significant amount of time when I said to him, what the heck did you make humans with emotions for exactly? <laughs> you can't possibly be that short-sighted, God. And he began to talk to me about the purpose of pain. And I went to Dr. Pritula today. You can't see it on my hand, but I had this something up with my knuckle right here. From I think it was from using the air nailer on the roof. So you're kind of pam, 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 50 million times. I don't know how many time nails we put up there. So I came off the job site with this real pain right here in my knuckle. And I couldn't, you can still see that I can't really do it yet. But you see how that knuckle is higher than the rest of them? So it's supposed to be like that. Do you see what I'm talking about? Anyway, he says there's a reason for that. There's some kind of a buildup on the inside of that knuckle. And the pain that I'm feeling has got to be dealt with. Or if you see the way that finger is tilting Kind of that way a little bit. Can you see it right there? It's kind of got a lean to it like that. See, that you can't really see it. No, it. Oh, Mike. So, anyways, so what he's saying is, whatever the damage is, the pain is because there's damage in there, and if I don't deal with the damage, I don't even know where I'm where I'm going now that I'm so far into this terrible story. And so. The pr anyways, the pain is evidence of something wrong inside the knuckle. Thank you, goodness, that I got to the end of my story. But the, 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 the pain, the negative emotion, is the indicator that something is wrong. 
when we do it, when we hold on to it like that, if there's a pain, if you have an issue or whatever in your physical body, the pain is there to alert you to the fact that there's a problem. Then once you've got that, now then just tell the pain to go. You don't need it anymore because I already know the problem is there. The same thing with the negative emotions. Negative emotions are the evidence that there is a deception on the inside of you. What's so awesome about this is that God did that so that we could go and find it. <clears throat> this is what, can I tell you? This is what happens. This is my heart. Uh, let's say, this is my whole heart. This is the section of my heart that's got truth in it. The rest of it filled with deception. That's Ian. Your pastor. What happens is that there is, we don't really know what all of that is. What we know about is the stuff that's creating the emotions. What happens with God is that because God is merciful to us, he's pretty co much covering all that other stuff. I mean, it might be a little every now and again it pops up, but for the most part, he's got it all covered. And what he does is he removes this piece, the grace that he's got covering all of the deception, making sure we're kind of stay alive and operating in the middle of it. He removes the grace from that portion. This is the piece that we feel. When he removes that piece, he's doing so not to punish us. He's doing so because he wants to give us a clue. You need to fix this. There's, a, there's, a, there's something busted that's causing the pain. And then we go down there. We figure out, okay, Lord, we encourage ourselves in the Lord. We go before the Lord and we get the strategy of what do I need to do to fix this? And then we fix it. And then what does God say? Now, this is the piece I had that was full of truth before. Now, this piece is all full of truth, too. Look at I'm making ground in my heart. What does God do? He gives me another piece. And I start to have a feel here that's negative, so I go after that one, too. Get that one done. Do you see what, how this is going to go? Does this look like puzzle pieces, Pastor Alex? Right? As God starts to put the puzzle pieces of the picture together, the way he shows us, I need you to deal with the puzzle piece, is you feel it in the negative emotion. Wow. Eventually, you get to the place, if you could be here long enough now, how Jesus' life was, his heart completely full of truth, all he ever experienced was positive emotions. That's what God wants for each one of us. He gave us emotions because he wants us to experience life in full tech color, Dolby Digital. He doesn't want us to live either in the black or in the gray zone. He wants us to live in the life and the experience of life that God has given. But if we don't realize what the negative emotions point us to and then find out how to get rid of the root behind that thing, what happens is we live our whole lives building all of the wrong things where we get, you know, older and older and older and older and older. And we're losing day after day after day after day because those days are being sold to negative emotions. And that was never God's intention. Let me end with this. What are the do's? Where can I write? One. <laughs> One. Bite your tongue. This is key. Don't say it. Learn how to get your own inner peace back. How do you encourage yourself in the Lord to let the volcano on the inside subside? Number, uh, here's my notes. If you can't discuss it without, you are not ready to talk about it. What you need to do is rise above, you want to ri learn to rise above the situation. A lot of times these negative emotions are so well developed, they feel real. Like you ever had that when, you know, you go down in the basement, you turn the light off and the monsters all appear? 
you're absolutely convinced that the monsters are there. You feel it in every fiber of your being. Turn the lights on. They're gone. Just, they're fast, eh? Where they just... <laughs> but you see, the emotion of it is so real. You have to learn, how do I get this emotion to not feel so real? The first thing I got to do is learn on the inside of me to get the emotion to go back down. And there's lots of things you can do there. Number two, develop, this is kind of key, I've discovered, develop same gender mentors. <laughs> same gender because guys deal with emotions different than girls. <laughs> Tread very, very <laughs> carefully here. I have that note right here. What's more important about it is that guys don't deal well with girls' emotions, negative, and girls don't deal well with guys' emotions. Okay? What you need to do is get a guy who understands, if you're a guy, get a guy who understands the negative emotions and how to deal with them and what the strategies are. Somebody who has got victory over that area. If you're a girl, get a girl who has had victory in those negative emotions and can help you with the strategies. Okay? It's really that it, the gender part of this is very important. Someone who understands what you what you're dealing with but who has the victory already. See if you because uh, you, you can get a posse of people who understand it but don't have the victory, that's not good. Okay? Somebody who understands it but has the victory and can work you through the, the mechanisms or the strategies or maybe show you the things the Lord has showed them in order for them to get out of that situation. Amen. That type of mentorship, believe me, as Pastor Alex, I think, was talking with the Connect Group last night, that type of mentorship is the fast way to mature, quick, to, to, to get the maturity level uh, you're looking for. I remember when I was learning to ski, I, was, I went to this university, the high school that I went to. The first couple years of the high school that I went to, I went to a different high school and we didn't ski. Then I went to this high school and they did ski. But these guys had all been skiing for three or four years by the time I showed up on the ski club. I don't, know, I don't even have to know how to put skis on. But I'm staying catch up with those guys. I don't want to fall behind. I don't want to be the guy that isn't part of the pack. So I pushed myself. By the end of that season, I, not, I wouldn't be to say I'm as good as them, but I could keep up with them no problem because their mentorship helped me to mature quickly in those skills. Okay, that's what we're looking for in this area, this, this, this same gender mentorship. Number three, they are, if they know the victory, if they know how to, they had the problem, they've dealt with the problem and they're victorious over the problem, it can very much help you to find the root. Yeah. Yeah. This is the key. Understanding how to get to the root. That's what God has this, this whole experience for you. As you're shaking your fist at God for why aren't you helping me with this? He says, I am helping you with it. I'm showing it to you. Yeah. And then I can go and find from the Lord now, just like David, I've settled myself down. I come into the presence of the Lord. I seek the Lord on the strategy. Lord, what's going on here? I let the Lord give me the strategy. This is what you need to deal with. Why did that bother you? What is it about the thing that that person did that got you? What about the circumstance that just messed you up? What is it about that as the Lord is working with you, trying to show you what's at the root of this? You see, if you do that and get the root, it's not like you have to continue dealing with this problem forever. If you get off on that thing, you literally won't have the negative emotion anymore. That situation, somebody comes in and spits right in your face. Now, you'd have killed them yesterday, but you process through that thing. And now it's like, oh my gosh, what are you spitting for? I, you must be having such a bad day. Let me give you a hug. Come on, come on, lay it on. Because the negative emotion that would have been, that would normally drive the person away in anger because they spit in your face. Now it's not there. I can engage with that person in a positive emotion, help them with their negative emotion. Now I have become the antidote. But you see, in our culture, we've not had the requirement placed upon us by the culture to learn how to mature through these negative emotions. Number 
five, oh no, the number four, learn the even so. Even so is, read the Proverbs every now and again. I mean Psalms, where David will whine a little and he will make sure he gets to, Lord, even so. Lord, you are. Learn how to do that. When you are in your personal time, you say, you know what, God, I've got this stuff going on right now. I just really need you to talk to me. I need, you, I need to understand. I know you're bigger than this. I've told you about my little spot. They have built me a beautiful little platform out by the lake. They built it just for me. And when I go and I have trouble, I go and sit right on that platform right at the end where the lake turns into the river. And I look out across the lake. Now, I don't know what it is with me and water. I love water. And so when I sit there, though, what I'm really doing is I'm looking out and saying, God, I think you're bigger than this lake. But this, this lake looks pretty big to me. And I'm just letting God get bigger in my particular situation that is apparently tearing me apart on the inside is getting smaller. That's what I'm doing. Now, that might, you, you, know, you may not be into water or freezing your in the middle of the winter, but find your spot where you can go to God and say, Lord, I've really got stuff going on right now, but even so, you're bigger than all of this. You hold me in the palm of your hand. I've got nothing to be afraid of. Number five, get a vision for your life beyond the misery. Pastor Alex taught this to me with working out. He said, don't worry about what you look like right now, which is awesome, of course, as you all know. He said, get a vision for what you want to, why are you enduring the pain right now in the, in the gym? Get a vision for what you're trying to do. That I want, and my grandchildren are showing up soon, and I want to be strong and energetic for my grandchildren. That's what I want to be able to do. I don't want to, you know, age the way normal people would normally age. And so I want to be strong, and I want to have energy at that time. That's what my vision is. I want to do that. And so get a vision for what is it like to finally be rid of the negative emotion that is tormenting you and uh, uh, lowering the energy and potential of every day of your life. Get a vision for what that will mean. And finally, you need to release your life into the hands of God. And I tell you something, one of the main reasons why people have such negative emotions is because they're holding so tightly onto the reins of their own life. And every little thing that appears to be messing with their life creates such a negative emotion for them. When you release yourself into the hands of God, realizing that He cares for you, that even through the negative emotion, God has a plan, even through the crisis, God has a plan, even through every single moment of every single day of your life, it's not that God would have you to go through that stuff. He did not intend human beings to live in misery by any stretch of the imagination. But I can promise you that your journey from where you started with God to the victory that he's got and the potential and destiny that he has for you is the process of dealing with all of these maturing things. So even in the difficult times, we're able to say, God, I know you've got a plan. And your plan is the best plan. God doesn't say, well, you know what? I know what you did yesterday, so we're going to go with plan 72 today, and you ain't going to like it. That's not what that God does. God finds the easiest way, even by going through the issues of your heart. He's got a strategic way of getting through the issues of your heart that are the easiest way to put the puzzle together. And all we need to do is release ourselves into the flow with God and say, okay, God, I'm really here. I'm really looking to let you do this with me. I'm not going to get overcome by the negative emotion. What I'm going to do is I'm going to allow the negative emotion to come before you and you're going to help me to deal with where, why is it there in the first place and deal with it. Simple. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? This is now... The, the job for each one of us as we are going through this process over and over and over again is allow God the time to teach you about the negative emotions that you're dealing with in your life. Don't own them. Just allow them to be okay for a moment. Acknowledge them. So many things that we do in our lives is we want to get, we want to expel them, get them out of us because they hurt so bad. 
rather than take the moment with them and say, God, I need this out of my life for good. We've got to go after the root. Get yourself into, if you can't do it yourself, there's people that can help you. Process that you have to go through to get that stuff out and out for good. Put your hand over your heart and say, Jesus, I know my victory comes from you maturing my heart and soul. I know you're all about getting rid of the deception and replacing it with truth. And I know that negative emotions are evidence of deception. All I need to do is take those before you, get the strategy, and work them, work them out. I can trust you. I know you're here to help me. I'm not afraid. We will be victorious. In Jesus' name.